So, uh, Mr. President, um, I'd, Senator I'd, from Pennsylvania. Thank you. I'd like to uh, uh, address the substance of this amend amendment, but let me start with a little context on this underlying bill. Uh, the, the underlying bill, of course, suspends the debt ceiling uh, from now until May 18th. And what that means is that in the meantime, the administration will be able to borrow as much money as it wants uh, within certain constraints, but a, a very, very large sum of money over the next uh, three and a half months, at which point the debt ceiling will be reinstituted at a higher level. We expect the government will probably borrow something on the order of $400 billion between now and such time as the debt ceiling is reestablished. We've got $16.4 trillion in debt today, so by the time the debt ceiling is reapplied, reimposed, it'll be just under $17 trillion. Now at that point, we'll be right back to the standoff that we were at very recently. Standoff over what to do about this massive amount of debt we already have and the massive amount of additional debt that the administration would like to create. Now the administration's position is very clear. They want additional borrowing authority with no strings attached. No conditions, no limits on future spending. They just want to be able to keep borrowing. And some on our side of the aisle feel very strongly that any increase in the debt ceiling that authorizes still more borrowing needs to be accompanied with some measure of spending discipline so that we can at some point begin to regain control over these out of control deficits and the debt. Well, in any case, what we know for sure is that this tension will reemerge and that we don't have a resolution in place now. And if this measure passes, which very likely it will, and it'll be signed into law. We've just kicked this can down the road until May, maybe June or July uh, at the most. But we surely will be back at this point where we're having this argument. Here's what else we know. We know that tax revenue, ongoing tax revenue coming into the government's coffers are going to be about 75% of all the money the government's planning to spend in the coming year, likely to spend. And since 75% doesn't cover everything, the other 25% is meant to be borrowed. And therein lies the necessity of raising the debt ceiling precisely to fund the difference between all that the government wants to spend and the tax revenue that's going to happen. And it's important to note, by the way, that raising this debt ceiling is not about paying for past bills incurred. I know that's repeated around here all the time. It's totally untrue. We have, a, we have a funding uh, for the appropriations process expires at the end of March. There is no appropriation that's uh, in place going forward. The debt ceiling increase, the authority to borrow more money, is all about funding future spending, which is part of the reason why some of us think this is a very sensible moment to try to bring some discipline to that future spending. And, and what would happen if we don't raise the debt ceiling right away? Well, if we don't, we'd have to have a 25% cut in all government spending. And that's, that's pretty massive. That's pretty problematic. Now, the administration and some actually go way overboard in the threats that, uh, that they uh, attach to this. They threaten to inflict the maximum possible economic damage if the debt ceiling isn't raised promptly upon the point at which they run out of their maneuvering room. So you hear threats about a default on our debt and senior citizens won't get their social security check and our military folks won't get paid. Uh, all kinds of the most disruptive, most damaging and most dangerous kinds of outcomes are threatened by the administration. Now, this is unnecessary, this isn't true, this isn't what would happen, but there's an incentive, of course, to try to scare and intimidate Republicans into giving the administration the unconditional ability to just keep on borrowing and spending as they've been doing, and that's why we hear this. Well, what my amendment does is it's an attempt to absolutely minimize the disruption the danger and the drama. It's an attempt to get away from government by cliff and to have a sensible approach to bringing our spending under control. It's called the Full Faith and Credit Act, and what it does, it says very simply, since none of us can guarantee that the debt ceiling is going to be raised on any particular date, I mean, we all know 
how we're going to vote. We can't control anyone else's vote. We certainly can't control a single vote in the House, and we can't control what the President might do. Therefore, we can never know for sure whether and when and under what circumstances a debt limit will be raised. So my point is the sensible and prudent and responsible thing to do is have a plan to minimize the downside if the debt ceiling is not raised immediately upon reaching it. This has nothing to do, by the way, with the current circumstances of suspending the debt ceiling. This is all about the next time in May or June or July when we find ourselves facing these circumstances. So what my bill says is if we get to that point, the federal government would be obligated to prioritize three categories of spending. That would be interest on our debt to make sure that we don't default on our debt and create a financial crisis. It would be Social Security payments to all, everybody who qualifies for a Social Security payment so that no senior citizen has to wait, worry and wait to get their check. And it would be active duty military personnel so that no soldier has to worry or wonder whether they're going to get paid. And by the way, what my bill does, it goes a step further and says not only will the federal government have to prioritize those three categories, but it says in the event that on any given day the tax revenue were not sufficient to cover those three payment obligations, the Treasury Secretary would be authorized to borrow additional amounts to ensure that those payments were made. So what does it do? It guarantees that it would be absolutely impossible under any circumstances to default on our debt, to miss a Social Security payment to anyone, or to be late with the military pay to anybody. That's what it would do. It would take a little bit of the, the drama and the risk and the uncertainty and the potential damage to the economy off the table and allow us to have an honest, sensible discussion about how we're going to get spending under control. Now, mind you, these three categories of spending, if you add them all up together cumulatively, they account for about one-third of all the spending the government is scheduled to engage in over the course of this fiscal year. Ongoing tax revenue is about three-quarters of all the spending that's going to occur. So clearly, there's far more than enough tax revenue to cover these items, but tax revenue comes in in a lumpy fashion. It doesn't come in smoothly and uniformly over the course of the year, hence the provision that allows the Treasury Secretary to borrow in the event that they needed to in the short run to, to smooth that out. But let me say, say something that's, that's more fundamentally important here. This is, amendment is not intended to be a replacement for raising the debt ceiling. Unfortunately, as long as we're running structural deficits, we're going to have to borrow money to fund that. This, this amendment, if it were to pass and be signed into law, doesn't mean we wouldn't have to raise the debt ceiling at some point. Of course, we're going to have to until we get to the point where we've got balanced budgets and don't have to continue to run deficit spending. And by the way, I don't think that it's desirable or optimal to cross into that threshold where we are living under the rules of prioritization because it's very disruptive to not be paying all the other bills on time as we ought to. That's much better. But my point is, there's something even more important here, and that is to fundamentally bring our spending and deficits under control. Trillion dollar deficits, a total debt that now exceeds the total economic output of our country. This is, we've got a disastrous fiscal situation on our hands. It's right now costing us jobs, costing us economic growth today, and it's guaranteed to result in a full-blown fiscal crisis and a meltdown if we don't change the path we're on. The only time we've ever been able to persuade this president to agree to significant spending reductions was the last time we argued over the debt limit. And we did end up getting spending cuts as part of that. But I think the urgency of getting our spending under control and getting our fiscal house in order so that we can ha avoid a fiscal crisis and have the kind of economic recovery we need, that's what necessitates a prioritization bill so that we can take the, the shrill excesses and the threats that some are, are claiming, take that off the table and have a discussion, a real discussion, and real solutions about how we're going to get spending under control. Uh, Mr. President, my uh, strong hope is that we can bring an end to government by cliffs. Um, Senator Portman has an amendment, I believe, that he's going to introduce which would prevent the danger of a government shutdown in the event that a CR 
continuing resolution expires. Makes all the sense in the world. We shouldn't find ourselves backed up against the wall at midnight on December 31st with a great calamity threatened if we don't pass some bill that nobody's ever seen. This is a terrible way to run the government, and that's what we've been doing. So what my bill does is it eliminates the risk of default, and it says, let's, let's, it creates the opportunity for us to bring some spending discipline and associate it with any future debt limit increase. Senator Portman's bill will avert the risk of, of a government shutdown. I fully support his uh, other efforts to make sure that we have a dollar in savings for every new dollar in debt we create. We've got an obligation to do that. We've already got too big a debt burden. We've got to begin curbing the problem that causes it, and that is too much spending. So, Mr. President, I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. As I say, it will not have any effect on the specific bill under consideration to temporarily suspend the debt limit. It will make a much more manageable and much less disruptive discussion when we address the debt limit once again in May or June or when that day surely will arrive. And with that, I yield the floor.